latter half of 1964, with the recent influx of British invasion bands dominating the American charts, Brian Wilson was working to a frenetic schedule. The overwhelming popularity of British acts had presented him with a formidable artistic and commercial challenge, and he had sought to meet it head on. The Beach Boys' All Summer Long was followed by both a live LP and a Christmas record. In a single year, the band had released no less than four albums. The pace started to bite, and it was the hated live performances that provided the final straw. On a flight from Houston during the group's winter tour, Brian suffered a fully-fledged panic attack. In the aftermath, it was decided that he would no longer appear on stage with the Beach Boys, that he would receive the long-sought freedom to remain in the studio and complete his work unfettered, and that a permanent replacement in the form of Bruce Johnston would join the touring band. Brian had all these jobs. He had to melodically write it, arrange it, go produce the tracks, vocally arrange what everybody sang, sing often uh, the, you know, the high lead part, parts or on Don't Worry Baby, all these jobs, right? And then go on the road. The guy, uh, you know, if he had kept up that pace, he wouldn't be alive today. So somehow he gets Glenn Campbell to fill in for th three months, and then I, I come along. I just probably got in there and he didn't have to go on the road anymore, and he could be uber prolific and work with the wrecking crew. And so the band now came home to tracks without the burden of those, those jobs, and especially being on the road. He made some great recordings. He was, you know, finally given that the leeway to be the the studio guy to be just in control of the music and the writing and the recording and the arranging and the producing that that was all him now even to the extent that he was being talked about it was on his own terms from this point on because it was about him as a creative artist you know not as a smiling pop moppet you know or sensation so he could uh, you know he was in control to a great extent and as long as he continued to make hits then he was allowed to be in control. And Brian instantly applied himself in the studio with all the fresh energy of a liberated man. New sessions commenced in January 65, and the years spent in study and experimentation saw Brian arrive at a level of control room proficiency that could match, and indeed deliver, the further reaches of his compositional vision. He started like a kid, you know, and reached a lot of kids and he was able to use that success to grow up in the studio musically quickly, you know? And, and instead of the piano, the recording process became his piano. The, the songs got better and better, and, and the music got better and better with, with, uh, with Brian, you know, as, as he felt more comfortable with us, and, you know, as the years rolled by. There's no question that Brian was becoming more sophisticated he wasn't afraid to talk to musicians. You know, he was a young kid. He realized that he could get up and say, you know, I want you to do this, and you do this, and you do this, uh, which is kind of the way he would tell his brothers and his cousin, and they would, you know, sometimes say, nah, we don't want to do that. You know, they were kids. But all of a sudden, Brian was now with all these pros, and he was getting what he, what he wanted. Brian was in control. It, it, this was Brian's date, you know, that there was no doubt about it. That, that's why I say, when people say he was fragile, I said, are you kidding? That's not Brian. Brian was in, in total control. And he felt that way at that time, too. Brian was the guy. He was the designated producer, you know, this great creative guy with the authority of General Patton. He was so clear sounding. It was a pleasure to work with him and know him in those days. From my point of view, I like his production better than if he could do it now, starting as a young guy, because it was so musical. He had to get it. It actually sounded like the finished product on its way to getting finished when you'd be in the studio, because without the technology, he was more on the floor. Uh, he'd have instruments leaking into other mics. I mean, that was part of the accidental production, you know, and, and you just go in there and, in the booth and you go, wow, this sounds pretty good. And then Chuck Britz would have things ready. Hey, Brian, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? You know, he'd audition tape delays and, you know, all kinds of really interesting things. 
if a musician wasn't getting it, you know, over the talk back, he would go out there and he would either show them or guide them. He was able to communicate well with the other musicians who were a bit older than Brian and had been around a bit longer, you know, had, this is old stuff for them. But with, with Brian's writing, it was actually new stuff for them. Brian would sometimes work for 20 minutes, say, thank you, gentlemen, and leave. And sometime we would work the full three hours or maybe longer, an entire weekend sometimes. He never accepted it unless he called me in and had me sit and listen to the song. He'd say, what do you think? I'd say, it feels good to me. It feels great. You got a great track. He'd say, okay, thank you, gentlemen, or let's try another song. Recording on his own terms, Brian was particularly industrious. He completed The Beach Boys Today by the end of January 65 and had finished sessions for a subsequent album, Summer Days and Summer Nights, by July. Though a high volume of output was nothing new, it was the character of both records that suggested a landmark had been reached. Much of the work, particularly on the second side of Beach Boys Today, departed from the scope of Brian's previous sound while even the more familiar pop hits included unusual augmentations and sonic feints. The impression was that of a rigorous, thoughtful artist undergoing an important transition. It was exciting because uh, Brian had his act together, so no one had to suffer through the tracks. Uh, of course, some of us loved playing on tracks and things. You know, Carl really loved to do that. Uh, so it was fun. You're, you're red hot, you come off the road, and you're getting used to Brian having some great melodies, and Mike's like a runaway fax machine for lyrics. He, just he began to have different kinds of experiences, experimenting with marijuana, becoming a very enthusiastic pothead, experimenting with LSD to a small extent, not nearly as much as ultimately people would say. Um, his do you know, the doors of perception swung open. And suddenly, you know, everything was up for grabs. Suddenly there were no boundaries whatsoever. Whatever he had been told about the limits of pop music, he just ignored altogether. And that really began to come out in the early months of 1965. I mean, the tunes that you can hear on the Beach Boys today, that suite of love songs on the second side that are very pensive and poignant and musically sophisticated. He takes side two of the Beach Boys Today album and totally dedicates it to ballads, but really strong ballads that have a thick sound with his bass playing, especially being prominent. Um, he takes the vocals and he does all kinds of jazz layers on it, like a song Kiss Me Baby, which is really more of a jazz tune than a rock and roll tune, you know, but it's one of those real interesting early fusions of jazz and rock and roll, you know. Uh, he takes that four freshman thing and spreads it out. Oh. 